So what are the secrets to being Masters world champ? What's training look like? Uh, other than the injuries? Yeah. They're not a... You don't need them. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want to have to have an injury to give you that motivation. But. <laughs> Do you have to have a world-class um, bike park and uh, <laughs> jumps in your garden, or would you say it's not a necessity? <laughs> Welcome to the Ride Companion, where today we've got Rowan Sorrell. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, dude. Good to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, and you. Yeah, absolutely. So this is sort of part of like, um, we've obviously had two thirds of, two thirds, is that fair? Two thirds of the Bike Park Wales team on. Half. Because Rowan's partner is also involved. Of course. Is that fair? But but she's not here now. (laughs) No. Okay. Yeah. Is that fair? That's right. Let's just go with that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah my wife was involved like the four of us were all involved in setting up yeah. Bike Park Wales and founding it um, but Liz now my wife it, she isn't part of the current yeah. setup so, okay yeah, cool you're, oh. you're kind of right just having all okay, right nice few yeah. few <laughs> did you listen to the to the other two thirds um, yes. podcast yeah they got it all right it was all historically <laughs> yeah. accurate yeah it's good <laughs> excellent yeah, good <laughs> stuff good stuff anything not right we silenced Anna's mic apparently <laughs> there's a few people complaining about that okay. <laughs> oh really yeah it was good though it was, it, it was amazing I loved that podcast I loved the um, I felt like I was there hearing hearing there's sort of that entrepreneurial spirit I feel like in everyone where you can imagine like setting up a bike park and yeah it's kind Certainly of the dream, isn't it? Dreamt about it, exactly. But to yeah. actually go and do it is really gnarly, really, really cool. Yeah, I posted a clip just the other day, actually, about why it. You know, I think the, I think it was titled like "Why is Bike Park Wells in Merthyr Tydfil?" It was something like that, and loads of comments underneath were like really positive. Again, saying like such an inspirational story and yeah. blah 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 blah. And I think it really is. It's probably one that will go down in history, especially in UK mountain biking. Yeah, fair to say. Yeah, I think I I think it's helped like develop the whole scene. Yeah, you know, if you jump back in time to when we set up eleven years ago, you know, the landscape was different at that time. Mm. So yeah, yeah, definitely, I do feel like that. Good. If there's a movie in the future, <laughs> 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 who would play you? Do you think? I haven't got a clue. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been called a lot of things over time. So, <laughs> so where do you grow up then? Uh, in South Wales, yeah, so I grew up in a village called Killian, which is just outside of Newport, and that's like, as you go over the Seven Bridge on the M4, it's the first city you come to, and I'm like 45, 50 minute drive from Bike Park Wales, right, so okay. like South East Wales. Yeah, okay, all right. So did you grow up in a family that was outdoorsy, mountain biking? What's the, I don't know what it's like around there, is it like countryside or is it more um, city vibes? I grew up in it's a village but like you know I grew up in like a, a housing estate in a village but it's on I lived on top of a hill okay and I do think <laughs> that's kind of like had a bearing on you know like my life I suppose in yeah. a way like, um yeah my parents were really into the outdoors like going walking like right. n- no interest in bikes but I guess like biking was still yeah, when I got into the sport, I, I feel like I've like seen most of the s- growth of the sport and the yeah, evolution right. of the sport. So mm. it's still quite new then. Um, but yeah, just like living on top of a hill, and when, when eventually you, you got a bike and you're you're playing around with bikes and your kids, we were riding downhill. You know, yeah, yeah, we were yeah. riding. We were doing urban street races before like <laughs> urban street races were a thing. So yeah, I think it's that's always um, yeah. Cool. I, it, it got me into bikes in that way, right? Did you have to build everything that you rode? Yeah. Yeah. See, definitely. I think there's something in that. I think like, like creating the scene when you're younger, you mean? Yeah. Creating like the trail network. Well, absolutely. I, th- I think there's something in building more than, I don't know, mm. the, the, the no dig, no ride thing, I think means more than just someone has to dig it to ride it. Yeah. Yeah. So, on the back of, so on, on this hill, like on the back, we had a little set of woods. So I started off like as a kid, I'd just, you know, you play in the woods, everyone does, and I'd just be exploring in the woods, so always like looking around and there's all these crazy banks and stuff when you're a little kid, and that's before I got into bikes. So then once you start getting interested in bikes, you're like, oh, well, let's 
go and take these up in the woods. And, yeah. Um, they were really small, like it, but it was on a quite a steep hill. And yeah, we just started carving out tracks in there. And uh, like even now, I think what we had back then as like young kids were were pretty good tracks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they were very natural. We just used like what was there in the shape of the hill. And um, we had one track called 17 Seconds. So <laughs> gives you an idea like <laughs> <laughs> how short they were. But that 17 Seconds was rad, yeah? Yeah. And you just repeat over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we'd have, you know, we obviously built like a number of these short, short tracks yeah, and I trails. So sh- sure, something in short tracks as well, isn't it? It's good. But obviously you then had access to bigger hills all around you. Yeah, definitely. So this was, like I say, just off the back of where I lived. And yeah. That was kind of the stuff you could, you could access and um, like play and ride after school. Like I probably got into bikes when I was like 14, 15. Yeah. Um, but yeah, not too far from where we were, we had pretty big hills. So one of the ones, like it's well known now, but before it had official trails and stuff, we'd still ride out to Kumkan. Yeah. Mm. So it was a long ride. It'd take us like <laughs> an hour and a half to pedal there. <laughs> um, you ride down the hill once and ride home. <laughs> um, yeah, that, and, and then there was another spot like not so far Wentwood, which is again, big, you know, pretty big hill. So we always had like bigger stuff that was within reach. Yeah. So Kum Khan didn't have a trail centre at that point? No, no, no. Yeah, this is kind of a long time before that. Yeah. <laughs> what was the age. first, I think you're the person to ask this question, what was the first trail centre you knew of, heard of, or had anything to do with? So the first trail centre that I really, I guess the first one I rode was Kum Khan after it had been built. But I was aware of like, you know, the birthplace of, trail centres was Coidy Brennan. Ah, was, is that so? Yeah. Yeah, so North Wales. Okay. I didn't actually know that. That was the first one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. So there's a guy, um, he worked for Forest Commission at the time, um, and he sort of had this brainchild of creating a, you know, purpose-built tr- trail for mountain biking. Mm. Um, David Davis, his name is, and yeah, he he's not in the scene now, but he was like really well known. I think he's got an MBE or something off the back of doing it, you know, because he kind of created this model, which, you know, we've ended up with trail centres right across England, Wales and Scotland. Um, But yeah, it was a number of years later, that sort of concept like rolled out and then it came to South Wales and we had Kumkan and Avonargoid. So yeah, that was my like first exposure to that type of riding. Out of interest, do you know what his angle was? Was it, was it a biking angle? Was it like a, a tourism angle? Was it a... I think it was primarily like biking, like understanding yeah. that there was a need to create something to get people out there. He also wanted to create something that was like pretty sustainable. Um, and then obviously with that, it's the, it's the tourism and getting people out and, and bringing people to areas that maybe they otherwise wouldn't travel to. Yeah. So that's where you get like the wider benefits. Mm. Do you know the history of that? Like what, obviously that was the first one in the UK. What's, if you go further back, do you know, like, where was the first trail centre? And Trail centres really are a, a, is a UK con- born really? concept. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You, you know, go. like, every country's got their, their own story, you know, and their own development of the sport and development of mountain biking. Mm. But, you know, in the UK, we had cross-country racing, you know, downhill racing, like, in the sort of mid-late 90s. And then you know, trail centres sort of kicked, started that right. like more mass participation, I suppose. Yeah. And then obviously as the sport has evolved, like there was a need for more and that's how things have progressed on from there. Interesting. So so most countries have, have sort of copied the UK model that was built by someone like da- David? David Davis, David, yeah. David Davis. Right. Yeah, I would say so. I'd say a lot of com- uh, countries have then looked at that as a model and, yeah. and taken it and applied it themselves mm. you know outside of the ski resort model yeah. you know where you've yeah. got a ski lift and you can you can run a bike park yeah type. they'll have come obviously you know, way bike before park. a yeah. bike park but i met a guy um became really good friends with him did did a lot of work for him who's from the czech republic right and he came over to wales quite a long time ago now and he just he, he'd heard about it online or, or read about it and he came and visited like north wales and south wales rode all these spots and was like 
I need to do this where I'm from. Yeah. And he like took the best parts of that, um, took it to his village in the Czech Republic, which is just like a sleepy rural town, like no tourism at all. <laughs> a lot of unemployment, yeah. like really difficult sort of conditions if you grew up there as a young person. Mm. Um, he got in touch with me and, and said, could you know would I be up for working and, and his English was terrible that time it was just like this mad email I just remember like it was just something about it you're like this feels really genuine yeah. like I need to get on the plane and go and meet this guy because yeah. he's like you need to get on the plane and come and meet me and so that's yeah. what happened and we just went to his local pub and spoke about it and he showed me his hill and yeah and then I got involved with that and that was amazing just to see that journey in that in a different context yeah 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 and like going back there they went from i think they had one like sort of b&b type place and then a few years later with he like he was a really driven guy you mm. know he's really sort of made this um amazing facility and then you know, could go back a few years later and there's like 300 bed spaces oh. and like three pubs and it's bikes was... everywhere you know and it's it's yeah. just totally changed that area and i think that's what's rad about bikes now it could, you can do that yeah true what well, when did when did you become motivated to do that like you you visited kim khan saw kind of the potential at what point did you start sort of thinking about track building and doing that yeah. stuff um a lot earlier i think than that was it so probably subconsciously some of it like yeah. my first first ever trip to france was like a yeah uh, an eye-opening moment <laughs> you know you go to Le Jay and that was before um youtube before social media so you don't know what's out there wow, you know, it's just yeah. like you've heard that it's a good place to go and ride downhill but you can't view it in the same way you can now so yeah actually going there is like i think it was my first this is my second time abroad ever with a bike yeah um you're young yeah yeah i was I think I was 20. Okay. Yeah, so I wasn't super young, but yeah. yeah. And um, blew my mind. I was just like, <laughs> this is the dream, you know, your chairlifts, downhill bikes, and the riding was really good. Um, so I think straight away I was thinking, like, where I live, the topography, there's, there's something there. Like, mm. you could have chairlifts across valleys, you know. I was sort of young, inexperienced, but, like, that big picture idea of, like, well, why couldn't you have Port de Soleil in south wales in the valleys so mm. i guess straight away there's sort of some visions and ideas yeah. but i didn't know how to like navigate any of that at that point um and then w i went to uni in leeds and met up with um phil saxena do yeah. you know phil yeah legend top bloke <laughs> um and he was already like sort of getting into trail building a little bit himself and long story short we ended up building the first ever four cross track yeah i was Fort just about William. to say yeah four cross track yeah so it was Phil, yeah. 2002 that was right um so F phil like had the the contract and he said you know could i get involved or would i like to get involved help him out do the testing jump yeah. building and all that so that was my first exposure to like doing it i suppose yeah. and at that point it was just a sideline thing that i went and did but straight yeah. away i was like I love this. I'm into this. You know, I feel like it's something I can bring something to as well. Yeah. So that was definitely like a, a, a moment where I felt I have a skill set that I can use in a, uh, in a way going forward. But still at that point, you know, it, it all had to unfold these things and it takes time. And um, yeah, after that, I ended up working in Mojo for a few years. Right. Um, and then I think Martin mentioned it before, me and Martin ended up working together building the Kumkan downhill track right. with well, Dunk go, yeah. as well. Um, and that was, I would say that's probably the turning point then. Right, where, okay. where I was like, okay, this is something. We just had this like fixed short-term contract. Yeah, We all jumped at the opportunity, but we didn't know what we were going to do afterwards. So I guess it's stuck, the motivation almost starts off like you're literally building stuff that you want to ride, aren't you? It's like... It starts off being like, I want to build a track, doesn't it? Yeah. And then it slowly moves towards, a, I don't know, like, it's, it strikes me how much difference um, Bike Park Wales has made locally. Mm. Like, at what point did that, did you notice that it was making a big difference when you started building these trail centres and stuff? 
Yeah, it, 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 I probably noticed that um, through the work I was doing with my trail building company. Yeah. So before Bike Park Wales, going back it's like 20 years ago, 2004, I set up um, Back on Track, so yeah. a trail building company. And we got, the work at that point was generally like trail center based work. So you weren't necessarily building what I wanted to ride. Yeah. So yeah. straight away, <laughs> I would, like that was the difference between you going out yeah, and building yeah, yeah, yeah. with your mates, yeah. doing what you want to build yeah. to like, this is a job, this is a career. I've got to deliver what the client wants. Mm. But I always had kind of a vision of trying to bring, try and bring those two slightly closer together th than where they were. Okay. Um, and what was it though? Like, what were you been asked to build? And what were you trying to build okay. at that point? So it's probably quite hard to <laughs> imagine this right yeah. now. But when I first started that company and started trail building, there were no berms on any trails <laughs> in the UK. Is that right? Like, I'm genuinely, like if you went to a trail centre, there were zero berms. Whatever country, you, you know, whether in Scotland, England or Wales. Right. You might get them on a downhill racetrack. Yeah. But... None. And I was <laughs> Why like, do you think that is? Was it just not a thing? It or was just time. The, the vision and the concept of like, if you like those forefathers of, of the sport, yeah, which yeah, they've yeah. done an amazing job to create this um, network of trails that got everyone into it. But they didn't see that as like a way of doing things and the trail being sustainable. Right. Yeah. So I just had a different view on it. I was like, we can combine these things. We can add... So trails didn't flow massively. Mm. Like you imagine you go in like carrying a load of speed yeah. and then you'd have to go around a flat 180 turn, <laughs> scrub all your speed off, go around it like quite awkward to ride yeah. and then go again and then stop and go around the corner and go again. So like in the simplest terms, I was like, well, let's get some like downhill bermed corners and you're going to start getting that sort of momentum and flow. And flow trails weren't a thing. Like wow. flow trails are still now it's just it's very normal but i yeah. think back then that didn't exist so it's kind of like that early vision of like how can we add some of the feelings and experience you have when you're riding downhill without it being gnarly and bring it to the yeah. masses yeah so it's like you can ride it on trail bikes but we're bringing that like reward buzz sensation you know and putting it into those types of trails we were talking uh, maybe a an episode or so ago about the style of bike that was around before oh man yeah. an enduro what we call a trail bike now yeah so you, at that point you're building trail centers yeah all trail centers you know style that's pre-dropper isn't it yeah what yeah what are people riding <laughs> yeah yeah that's, that's true yeah we're still at like the tail end of they were more XC oriented bikes, weren't yeah. they? Quite, quite flimsy. Okay. Um, so the trails maybe <laughs> did suit the bikes mm. better at the time. Like you look at them now with our current technology and you're like, yeah, those trails just really don't challenge us. But yeah. obviously you're being more challenged because yeah. the bikes were shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so th there's an element of that, yeah. I, I, must, I, I was laughing so much when I'd listened to Weaver with you guys and when he was talking about he was talking about the, his early days of riding and it just brought me back and it was so <laughs> funny like chain devices that <laughs> don't keep chains on <laughs> and like every ride you'd have a punk you know you got tubes you oh got man. tires that are flimsy and it's just like you delete that from your memory because it's so painful <laughs> every ride one of you would be fixing your bike it's so bizarre because like from living here you travel four hours to go to a track that you've, you've heard that you've built a track. This is literally what you, you built Breckford, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Breckford was like, I just heard rumors about it. I'd seen one picture in dirt magazine and I'd heard rumors that Rowan, I didn't know you. Yeah. I'd heard rumors that Rowan had built a track there. Yeah. So then we set off to go to Breckford or wherever it was that we set off. And then you're like, just riddled with punctures. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> like you try, you travel so far. And then you get one lap on a track <laughs> that someone's built. Like you compare that to today's mountain biking, it's true. It's very much like a um, type one fun. It yeah. used to be type two. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're gonna have two punctures. You're gonna have the chain off. So true. Yeah. 
There was, uh, I, I was with someone the other day who wasn't really a mountain biker. They're more of a Makamoto guy. And he was asking the exact same question. He was like, oh, the e-bike. I was showing him my e-bike. And he's like, oh, it's quite heavy. Like, do you get loads of punctures? I was like, honestly, mate, like, touch wood. Couldn't tell you last time I had a puncture. It was like months yeah. and months and months and months ago. And he couldn't believe it that, like, we've got to that place now, I think. Yeah. To some extent, I know downhill races are lost. You don't even lost. it, though, like, how you good do. it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you don't even worry. I do, like, yeah. That's what I mean. You almost need something to just, like, take you back to, yeah. you know, like, reminiscing with someone. You're like, we've come so far. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not been that long, really, in the scheme of things. No. You know, it's a young sport, but bikes are so good now. And, and like, what you can ride on those bikes is incredible. Like, yeah. we're riding on just a standard trail bike you can ride any downhill track that you you know we would have raced yeah. on or even currently people do race on so i think that's been part of it you know the evolution of bikes has meant that trails have had to kind of try and keep up with that as well yeah, yeah. yeah. i remember really riding um you don't really ever do it now, but riding like careful. I never really ride careful yeah. now, if I'm honest. I, yeah. I, I actually don't ride careful at all. I smash into stuff. Yeah. I don't care. But I remember going to Avon yeah. and doing the, the climb and you're like, God, this climb's long. Like, yeah. It's a really good climb, really well built climb, but um, it's long and I've really paid for my descent. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the descent, like that, like... I'm like breaking the whole time, like picking lines, like being really careful because <laughs> I just get don't want a rear puncture. Oh, yeah, no. I've got like ardents on or something, like yeah. some yeah. skinny wool tire, and <laughs> it's just it, it's such a different thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's changed a lot when you think about it. Yeah, it has. So when you so when you were building like that breakfast is a good example for me because that was one of the first images I saw where I was like, "Wow, this is this is these aren't berms that you can build by hand. These are like yeah. machine berms." Um, did you surface it and stuff like what what things have changed as you've yeah trails? sure yeah breakfast is the first project where I guess I had that free reign and the opportunity to bring some of those ideas I was saying try and bring them to the table um I work with a great guy from the forestry there who's he's he's an engineer and he got in touch with me and you know he said would you like to work with us his name is Brian Rumble <laughs> absolute legend of a bloke honestly I learned a lot from him right yeah. and I've always I think I think I've always worked with really good people and you learn so much yeah from working with people um so he had like all of the um kind of like the engineering background like knew about how soil types rock right. drainage all of that stuff which I was just a mountain biker you know yeah. I hadn't mm. gone and studied trail building no. I built tracks in the woods and then it was that sort of mesh of my enthusiasm, <laughs> vision, you know, try and, and setting out all the lines and like his sort of engineering and working together that, that made that work, I think. And then you take that stuff forward with you. So like every project you're, you're learning. Like I still learn all the time on site now. You know, mm -hmm. we, we can be doing something new at the bike park and you'll pick up something we haven't done before. So what was the process like back then? Like in yeah. the way of so the what's it called Bre Bre breakfast breakfast so yeah. how did you go about plotting where the trail's going to go and yeah. yeah yeah that's yeah that's a good question massive Cause, learning cause it is no different. doubt from yeah. going from a shovel to using machinery <laughs> yeah yeah so how i started out um obviously the the projects then were quite different because it was setting out we'd have a massive forest breakfast huge and we were building like cross country loops in it. So you've right. got loads of space. Makes it a bit of a challenge to get your head around the whole area because mm. it's so big. Yeah. So I'd get out there, drive as much as I could, you know, whatever you could get up to on road, um, cycle as much as I could on any like pass that went through. And then you're just hiking, you're yeah. sort of learning it. So it's a combination of looking at maps and physically getting out there. And then I'd use like GPS to like plot interesting bits and start to try and put some ideas and lines together. Okay. How'd that work then? Um, so, <laughs> but, yeah, obviously not with a phone. Yeah. But, um, but we had like handheld GPS units that you plug into a computer afterwards. Right. So you could, those wires you could you know track you... yourself. Yeah. <laughs> two sticks. So it's like flags, <laughs> like digital flags you're putting yeah, in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'd say more so, like I'd use that and it's a tool and it's a good tool, but I'd just be trying to build a, map in my head yeah you know, okay, you're trying to like you. like i always think 
that's what I find the most useful. Just learn as much as you can and put those pieces together in your head. At that stage, I guess you're going to be driving the machine anyway, or you're going to be on site anyway. Going to be on site. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, going back to the question, like the process after that was certainly back then the way I would always work with like a third party. So if you, if you like as empl- employed as a trail designer yeah, and then we'd, we'd set out all of the routes sort of, put together the ideas and the design for it and then we'd work with a third party who i've got no connection to right yeah so they've been like employed by the client usually and then you've got to try and manage that digger driver (laughs) and tell them how to build it so that was who are not necessarily bike people normally exactly yeah yeah yeah. so that's how i like that's how trail building started for me and i think that is how trail building was at that time like everything until then that's that's how trails were built and I quite quickly realized like that isn't the future Um, that hasn't got the longevity that's not going to get us where we need to go okay because there's only so much you can teach someone in a couple of months and then you're working with someone completely different somewhere else yeah Um, so yeah eventually the the company had sort of developed so we could employ our own staff so I always just then went to employing riders who didn't know how to drive a digger (laughs) And, and develop, let develop them, them yeah, develop. Yeah. Um, because the other way around, I tried it the other way around, like employ a digger driver and and get them. But it is much harder because mm. they need to be able to see, you can talk and explain stuff and wave your arms around and, and they're like, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, you have yeah. to specify everything, I guess. If someone's in a digger and they can't ride, you have to specify angles, radiuses, everything yeah. has to be like... And you might think you've done that and you've explained it like perfectly and then you go away for two hours, you come back, you're like, we'll start again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So Did you know in that early, fault. those early, sorry to interrupt you. Did you know those, in those early years of doing it and managing teams that weren't necessarily bikers that there was a future or did it feel like disconnected from what you actually were doing before? Does that make sense? It's like you're out doing it with a shovel or whatever yeah. or on your own and then all of a sudden you, you've got a team of people did it ever feel like disconnected from what you actually wanted to be doing? Um, I think I was always aware that we had we had to deliver in line with like the brief. If the, yeah. the client was set as a brief, you know. Yeah, so okay. I, I was trying to slowly raise the bar. Yeah, but you can't Without. go from there to there in, in you know one okay. step I, so I you want, had a vision I, already of i like, had a okay, vision of like progressing people that riding ride. yeah yeah and in terms of what we're trying to put on the ground like a, a progression of riding but forestry commission as they were then it's now nrw in wales but you know collectively if you like the forestry commissions right they have a fairly risk averse you know yeah. take yeah. On, on on this so it was trying to get the balance where they're going to be happy because they're my employer mm. But I wanted riders to go there and be like stoked on it. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we navigated that in those early projects quite well. Mm-hmm. And that's what sort of enabled things to progress and move more towards what we've got these days. Okay. I suppose at that stage as well, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but you're obviously a really high level rider. You were racing, you were, so you had to kind of, you don't want to put your name to something that isn't good, do you? No, no, that's it. And that's, that's tough because I'm not getting to build exactly what I want to. Yeah. But yeah, there's definitely a, an element of that. You know, you want to be proud of your work. Yeah. Like, that's what we all want, isn't it? We want job satisfaction. Um, mm. Yeah. But I think those experiences from riding and traveling and vis- racing, you know, even yeah. in different places, you can bring all that to the table. And it, I, I think it, it was only ever a a help not a hindrance yeah 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 be interesting then to fill in some gaps from up to where we are now in the life of Rowan Sorrell which is the yeah. starting a trail building company so before that then yeah racing riding what is your career looking like at that point as far as riding and just come out of uni there's a lot to fill in there so <laughs> basically tell us yeah. about your life <laughs> up until age 20 because we've not like you say we've not talked about like actual racing and riding yeah and you've got so. some stripes haven't you mm. i've you got, I have some, got stripes. some stripes i don't want to make you say it you've got some stripes, yeah. yeah recent stripes yeah, yeah. They're, they're stripes all the same they're stripes all the same yeah. yeah 
I reckon world champ in the house too. I know yeah. more on the world champ and the stripes after this insanely good ad break. Oh, it's going to be a good one actually. Yeah, yeah it's banging. Companionship. Are you looking to take ownership of your health? Introducing AG1, a powerful daily nutrition supplement designed by scientists to support your body's needs. AG1 is a comprehensive and convenient blend of over 70 high-quality ingredients packed with vitamins, minerals, and whole food-sourced nutrients. With just one scoop each morning mixed with water, AG1 helps to support your brain, heart, energy, and immune system. It's a powerfully simple way to start your day right. While we have a degree of individuality, science tells us that the human body is interconnected, which is why AG1 contains over 70 ingredients to support your baseline nutrition. Drink AG1 is the best way to feel reassured that you're supporting your body with a broad range of nutrients it needs. AG1 isn't just another supplement, it's a morning ritual, a timely habit that fits seamlessly into your routine. And it does fit into my oh, routine dude, it does, yeah. because I just do it in the morning before anything. Apparently, you're meant to have it on empty stomach, which I actually quite like. I take it with me in my little AG1 shaker and just go walk the dog. I do it empty stomach every yeah. time, actually, Yeah, because it, it said on the instructions and I did what was on the instructions. That's you know what the I mean? sort of people we are. Davey, what are the benefits? Well, Ollie, they speak for themselves. From sustained energy throughout the day to immune support and stress management, AG1 has you covered. Plus, AG1 is NSF certified for sport, ensuring the highest quality ingredients and manufacturing standards. Ready to take the next step in your wellness journey? Visit drinkag1.com slash ride companion today for a special offer. We are going to give you free one year supply of vitamin D3 and five free AG1 travel packs with your next purchase. So that's drinkag1.com forward slash the ride companion. That's right, mate. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Drinkag1.com forward slash ride companion. Take ownership of your health with AG1. Check it out now. Check it out now. So yeah, where were we? The stripes. We were gonna. Well, we we're gonna talk about the run up to the stripes. Maybe we're go, gonna yeah. talk about like yeah, racing. When okay, so you sort of briefly spoke about finding biking through living on top of a hill. And then, yeah, what was the journey like from then? Yeah, so my first... Tough question on the right <laughs> yeah. <companion> today. <laughs> I got into mountain biking because, again, it's like it, I've been doing it a long time <laughs> and um, I didn't know about downhill when I started. Because right. I think because there just wasn't much of it. Yeah. So my first... We always used to just play around and then someone in school was doing a cross-country race. So I went and did like two or three cross-country races which were kind of Forest of Dean that sort of area not far from me yeah loved it to be honest it was great like but I always enjoyed the downs you know it's like trying to overtake as many people as you can <laughs> down and you then you get hill. smoked yeah. on the ups yeah. <laughs> so yeah that that was kind of how I started out and then uh, someone in school was like oh there's a downhill race gonna be uh, um, and it's actually not far from where Bike Park Wales is now it's just on the next hill oh, over. Wow. The dragon, what was it? No, it was like pr- paddle hounds. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, my first race. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, I went along to that. Like someone's dad in school took us all up. We camped for the weekend. Yeah, it was proper. It was so good. Like memories of that weekend were amazing. Um, yeah, and you get to see all the pros. That's the thing. Like, yeah. it's such a great sport. You know, you turn up and there's no barriers. Yeah, no. You're, you're there. You can watch these guys. So Who are the guys then? Up. I remember, I'm pretty, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Tom Edwards is Cade Edwards' dad. Yeah. 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 So he was on MBUK team then. I remember he was there and he was like just manning down this like big rough straight and we were all like, oh, you know, never saw like, it, did you? There was no social media. You can't even yeah. imagine before. And it's very difficult. Social media. Yeah. Now. So it has like, I think in a way, it almost has more of an impression on you. Definitely. Because yeah, you're, like, I'd, I'd you're not exposed agree. to it. Mm. Um, yeah, I did one downhill race. I was fully rigid, cantily brakes, you know, and uh, rattled my way down. But that was it, you know. I'm like, well, this is my thing now. I, this is it. That's the bit I've been enjoying, and now I know I can yeah. race. So, yeah, kind of got into racing. Never did lots of races when I was younger because I couldn't get around to them. Okay. So I sort of, like, grew into it almost as I got older and I had my own means. Mm. Um, the Dragon Downhill Series was a big sort of thing for us like living in, in South Wales when that kicked off in 99 because the tracks were were proper yeah you know, they're pretty challenging yeah 
I was kind of into my strides then and um, Jason Carpenter who used to run the series he pretty much like employed me as crash test dummy <laughs> so if he built something daft a jump or a steep section whatever it's like well come and test this. <laughs> like, crash on it usually <laughs> <laughs> yeah but did that dragon series for years um, yeah and just had chipped away and then eventually like I never ever thought when I started riding it was a possibility Right, because it didn't have the pathways it does now, but yeah. eventually I ended up doing World Cups. Yeah, but came to them quite late. I oh, really? think I did my first one when I was like twenty four, and oh, wow. did them till I was about thirty. Or yeah, um, but loved it. Like absolutely loved. It was, you know, full privateer. Mm. You know the way things are now. I How were you making wouldn't... a living back then to go to the races? So it started out. I was I was working at um, Mojo for yeah. a while, and then I was actually when I was kind of in the middle of my World Cup um, racing, if you like, I was running the trail building company. So it was tough mm. just because there's a lot, right? Running a business is difficult. Yeah. So it was, I was balancing a few things, but yeah, I loved every minute of it. So like the starting the business was funding you going racing yeah, as well. exactly. And yeah. a good marketing tool. Yeah. Bit. Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it helped. I think it, yeah, it helped me develop the business. It helped me see new places. If I went and did a race somewhere, I'd always try and tag on, like visiting some other places so okay. I could see like what the biking scene was like and what people were riding and what they were building and then like try and bring some of those ideas back. Whoa, that's cool. Really cool. <laughs> what do you reckon the single, out of all your travels, what was the single biggest thing you took back from, uh, oh, great question, from going away and seeing what other people had to back to Wales kind of? I mean, I, I've, I saw a lot of things which really impressed me and I thought were great. But I also saw a lot of things which I didn't think were delivered very well. So I, I, it's almost like I, the negative side was as important as the po positive side. And I think it's because at that point, everywhere with biking was a secondary thing. So right. we've got a ski lift, we've got a ski season, we'll do some bike, you know, we'll open up the lift, we'll do some biking. And not many places had like a sole focus on biking. Right. So it took time, but like that idea of being able to have something where you solely f focus on the product of riding and there's no compromises. Yeah. I think that is the long-term benefit <laughs> that I got. That, that was like, ultimately that's what Bike Park Wales is. Yeah, um, and, and also the lack of provision for trail bikes elsewhere at that time. So yeah, again, seeing like in the UK we were like ahead of the curve with what had already been done with trail centres, and then just trying to continue on that evolution, like yeah. make mountain biking evolve, let like let the official set sites help people's riding evolve. Yeah, yeah, totally makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think I, I I really remember going going away and seeing the reason I ask is because I remember going away and seeing how it was in other countries and mm. I like I really was just in a tiny bubble here in yeah. in the Surrey Hills for instance and I feel like back then everyone probably felt like they were in these bubbles like I remember watching probably videos of you riding um uh, Welsh Dragon series and just thinking God the downhill there is so much gnarlier than what we have here mm. and then you do the same thing again and you go to france yeah. and you're like oh my goodness it's yeah yeah keeps going yeah it's yeah. fascinating isn't it it's, yeah. like, it's like weird to think i think i think going to whistler is uh, or for most mountain bikers that's uh it's a moment you it strikes you doesn't it it's like wow you know these guys have got <laughs> such an amazing like set of it, it's an amazing hill but like what they've done with it as well yeah so i first went there and I think I was like 25 or something. So I, I just started um, the trail building company. So yeah, that, that was quite important, I think, to go to Whistler and see. That's kind of the best example in the world, I think. Yeah, you know, it evolved loads from then as well. I've never been to Whistler, I'll be honest. Can't yeah, it has. But, it yeah. has, but it was kicking ass then. You know, it's <laughs> like, it has evolved and there's more, but it hasn't evolved at the rate you might think. Mm. Yeah, I think like back then it was already that the the key stuff you wanted to go and ride was there, you know your big jump lines like they have more of them now, but yeah, the stuff that you couldn't get elsewhere 
What yeah. was it that struck you the most? I like the variety, but I have gotta say, at that point in time, it was a line. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because there was nothing like it anywhere yeah. else. Like, no one had got a good jump line like that. So, the jump line, uh, like, specifically on A-line, what was it about it that was so impressive? Um, drop in. Okay. No pedal, no brake. Yeah. Flow. So, it's like how safe and easy they are, right? Yeah, yeah. And riding with people who weren't super confident on jumps back home. So, like, with, within our group, we'd have, a, you know, mix of riders. And some of them wouldn't be super confident jumpers and just watching them ride that trail twice, three times, and it's like, bang, it's clicked in already. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just the progression that they get. So, yeah, I think have the consistency of all the jumps. Yeah, nothing's like crazy or going to catch you yeah. out. Yeah. So that sort of, trail. Did, you, did you feel like you wanted to bring that back to Wales? Definitely. But um, we weren't going to get that opportunity you yeah. know certainly at that time <laughs> i was kind of yeah, yeah yeah but yeah of course like everyone wants to ride that i think yeah, i've never ridden it but it, anyone who's been to whistle have you ridden a line yeah but you've ridden a470 right yes but it's in the wind okay, okay. okay in the wind different experience i feel like it's actually <laughs> yeah. true there's not really wind and rain yeah it's sheltered yeah it was different but so that, you, is that kind of the idea obviously is yes. A470 is like a yeah, Welsh yeah. version of it? Yeah, it's like a, a, a condensed version, yeah. I would say. Okay. You know, the name is a little bit of a nod <laughs> to it. So A470 is the dual carriageway that you drive up to get yeah. to Bike Park Wales. But um, yeah, clearly like with the A, it's, it's a bit of a nod to, to A-Line in Whistler. And I, you know, I think it's just a compliment to them, isn't it? You know, everyone around the world really has heard about it mm. or they've ridden it and... You never hear a bad word said about no, it. It's, it's no, a great don't. trail. And I, I think it's hard to achieve what... They've been doing it so much longer. So you yeah. don't build a jump line and generally like get it nailed first time. They take development and tweaking and time. And that line's been there for a long, long time, like 20, I think 20 plus years. Really? Yeah, something Fuck. like that. that. You went quite early into its life. Fair, yeah, but it's still been there... Uh, a while already I established yeah. see i would have loved to have gone back then because i only yeah. ever saw I, I went and but by the time I, I went to whistler i'd seen a lot of bike parks and trail centers and what have you mm. i'd already they'd already come up but i feel like when you went it was pretty early on right it was like yeah now i'm saying that i'm thinking <laughs> it must be a lot longer than 20 years because <laughs> it was 20 years ago i went and I, and it wasn't a new trail like it had been there yeah a, a while oh. like but it was, it was like this years. thing that people talked about back then. Like A-line yeah. was just yeah. like jumps down a hill. And I remember watch, looking at like travel features in Dirt or in the UK and them just talking about like, you you literally can't believe it. There's four minutes or something mm -hmm. of yeah, jumps just and just turns. Jumps. Are, you, are you serious? There's four. Yeah. You're used to like, you'd travel a long way to ride three jumps in a row. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 It's just un unbelievable to think, actually. I wish you could go back. And also, on the on the bikes back then, good building would have meant a lot more. <laughs> if you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they weren't getting you out of trouble, were they? <laughs> no, no. They definitely weren't. They definitely weren't. So who were your first, like, some of the bigger clients that you started working with on the on the company when you launched it? When you started actually bringing in mountain bikers as well? um for the for the track building yeah it was generally like the public sector so forest commission wales and forest commission england were mm. definitely our like regular clients and they were the ones where you're likely to get the bigger projects from yeah because they, they own all of the forestry land um but we worked for a number of local authorities as well uh councils on um v variety of different types of projects we yeah. did uh, up in Lancashire, we did a whole load of work up there, which was for the local authority. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually it sort of snowballed and we started doing more for private clients as well. All right. Okay. Yeah. Like, who's a, are you allowed to say who's an example of a private client? Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you mean like single person? Uh, no, I mean like the pr private sector. We, we did okay. two of, we've done a few projects for single people i will i will name check one person please yeah, yeah. well not well known but like well known <laughs> in, in south wales like so did we did a little build for a guy called hugh so hugh lloyd lewis and 
Yeah, he, Lloyd Lewis. He's he's a hell of a character. Really, really nice I hope guy. So Tom Jones. And um, he <laughs> decided he wanted a pump track to ride. And they because this was before like pump tracks were you know in more locations, uh, and he wanted to ride it through the winter. So he rented a unit, and we built a pump track in his unit. Yeah, which uh, serious cost to him? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just paying for the Indoor rent. Indoor pump that. track. Yeah, yeah. So it was really tight. That was the only thing. It was quite a small unit, so it was tight. But yeah, we built that was a, a mega project, and he was good enough to say, you know, you guys come and ride it whenever you want. So we not only got to do like a nice little project, but so is this got a celebrity off the back. Uh, no, he's not a celebrity. Okay. No, no. Just a wealthy bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and then <laughs> and then it sort of rolled on to like private sector. So. People who would build bike parks, so, right? Yeah, you know, obviously, I, bike park Wales being the main thing that it went into. But since then, we've been out to um, Ireland and worked at Glen Cullen. Okay, the Gap, it's called. I don't Have know. you ever been there? No, but I really uh, it's on my list. Dan Wolf yeah. rides a lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, like Greg will ride there. Dan Ronan, you know, all those guys like will use it now, and you'll it see it on their great Instagram. Fun, that mm. And it's quite a. Sh- you know, it's not a big hill, but um, super fun. Yeah. And the people who run it, it's a, it's, it's a family that own the land and they live on the site. And they are like amazing people, like amazing hosts, as you can imagine, like Irish. It's, it's just off the back of Dublin. You've got a city okay. and you, you're looking down on Dublin. Beautiful. So, yeah, that's cool. And um, I didn't know you. I didn't know you had something to do with that. Yeah. Just I, help helping them get established, really. Yeah. You know? So we did their... Well, well, all of the trail build. Yeah, get them up Amazing. and running. Wow. Well, it looks banger. I'm looking forward to going there. I, I actually spoke to Dan last night about when I was going to oh, head nice. over and stay yeah. with him and ride there. I yeah, guess we'll be riding should. there. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So at what point in your trail building did, did Bike Park Wales even become like a dream or something you even <laughs> thought about? Yeah. Um, Martin and I worked together at Kum Khan. Yeah. And then we both kind of went our separate ways, you know, just with our careers if like he went to Canada he started working with brands and I had set up a trail building company but at one point I I knew he was coming back from Canada and I had a project going in Gorton don't know if you know that one yeah Yeah. so it's like on the Cornwall Devon border and it was a little down it was one of the first sort of downhill uplift projects after Kumkan at that time Um, and I dropped him a line because I wanted to know if he was around just bring some of what he experience in Canada to the table or just kind of sanity check some of my ideas so so I think like us working together there we, we'd obviously both been having our own separate thoughts without yeah you know knowing this but um yeah I think when we we worked together there it was only for a few days just to look at stuff then we went our team went in and built the trail and then I gave him a shout and it's like it's open now come down and do this the opening ride and we had a really good day's riding and at the end of it it's like we need to do something like this in South Wales. Just kind oh. of throwing it out there. And he's like, yeah, we do. And and it was enough that it was like, okay. <laughs> so it, uh, it was that. And then we just picked it up. Gorton, up. of all places, eh? I think it was just the fact that it was the first time where, or for me anyway, where I, I delivered something that was starting yeah. to get closer. It was the package, wasn't it? it yeah, was like but it was still uplift. building it and then handing it over to a client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas there's always this concept of, I want us to operate it and manage it because then you're like really in control of the quality and you can evolve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And does that, what does that mean? Going back, making changes? Is that what you mean as well? Because I think some of my experience have been around people who build bike tracks. Like some of them, you just deliver this project and then you walk away six months later, it's absolutely toast. you've hit the nail on the head, yeah. Like 100%. Yeah, yeah, that was so. I started in 2004, um, with on track, and then 2009 was when me and Martin sort of said, Right, let's actually do this. Well, those five years they've been great. We've done loads of projects and worked really hard, and I, I loved it, you know. I mm. was super passionate about it and we were, we were getting some pretty good projects and it's like we were progressing but i really struggled with that yeah so we would work really hard um do the best job you can with the budget you've got and all the constraints hand a project back and then i'll go and ride it like a year later <laughs> or like two years later and, and and 
not always, but like ninety percent of the time, like they're gonna get they just the, de- the degradation of that trail has just kind of taken away some of its yeah you know, the excitement, the fun from it yeah, and the model that was there in the UK at the time because these were always pretty much like they were free trails to ride, which is fantastic. Mm. But the problem with that is there's no money then to look after them. Yeah. So it's like as mountain bikers, we were getting this great sort of opportunity to ride all these new trails, but they were just on this sliding scale of like, you, you get it when it's good, yeah, get yeah, it yeah. when it's hot, and then it goes down. So yeah, I, I did. I really struggled with that. And um, I was trying to figure out how we could do things differently because the way public contracts work, they can't give you like, because we asked this, obviously, we're like, can we have a maintenance contract yeah, and we'll yeah, keep yeah. that trail really good and we'll do it for five years or 10 years. But the way public tenders and money works, they're, they're not allowed to do that essentially or that they or they won't have the budget to allow that. Mm. Um, so that was a massive part of like, again, that sort of idea and vision of Bike Park Wales is like having complete control over the product, being able to look after it, being able to maintain it and knowing that, and, and to be, be able to be proud of it from year one to yeah. year 20 or year 30, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and we completely shared that vision. You know, Martin had worked in Whistler. So, you know, he'd seen the Whistler model and he worked in the trail crew there for a little bit. So, yeah, we were just on the same page that mm. that's the only way you could do it. And it, it felt. It's interesting though. So, you, so when you built those trails, you were asking the forestry or the council or whatever, like, look, this is going to be the problem though. We're going to build it. It's going to be sick. It's going to be really fun for a few months. And yeah. then it's going to start degrading and there just isn't, is it, is it still the same? Unfortunately, yeah. 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 I think things are a little bit better and there's more awareness. Mm. So you might find that there's a, a shorter term like maintenance period, like usually two years you okay. might get in your contract now, yeah. which is great. And that means then there's a commitment from the builder to go back and do periodic repairs, mm. um, which can look all sorts of things. Sometimes it's a bit of a token gesture and sometimes it's, you know, the real deal. Yeah. But it's not a long lived thing typically yeah. because there isn't, the, they can't say that they'll have that budget in five years time. So they won't commit to it. Um, and there isn't like a model of getting revenue. You know, it's a shame to think that you have to make it commercial, but ultimately if you want a really good product, you do. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Do you think it's that or do you think it's like ownership? Like if no one owns something, no one looks after something, it's like... Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really fair point. I think that is the alternative. You know, a, okay, brilliant example, Tepentuous. Right, okay, yeah. So no one pays to ride there, yeah, yeah. but what a great place. And those guys, they they take ownership of it. So you're right, like, and, it, and a dig spot, trail spot, you know, dirt jump spot, you might have... You know, people who have ownership of it. It's so it's, hard to create that though, isn't it? Like, how do you do it? You can't create mm. it from, you can't apply it to something that, if we came in and built a trail, you can't then say, you can't build you a community around it. it. It's really, really it's really difficult. Harder. I yeah, think the hard. community have to be 100% invested in yeah. creating it. Mm. I don't understand idea. how you do it. We've got the we've got the jumps up the road. Yeah. And I always thought if, if I was a young person and someone just said to me, oh, there's this place up the road. And then I went there. I'd be like, oh my goodness, this is mine now. I can look after it. I can make yeah. it good. And I've, I've failed every, every single direction I've tried up there. I've failed. Like you do a dig day. It doesn't work. People think if they've got a dig day, they've been to the dig day. I've got my ticket for the whole year. I don't need to dig yeah. anymore. If you leave it yeah. to them, it just falls into disrepair. It's like I don't even know what the answer is, to be honest, it's, other than making it. That's the it's, thing, it's like, really tough. Dirt jumps is a great example, isn't yeah, it, really? Because yeah. you've got these pockets of scenes that maintain, and I guess that's where some of the negativity used to come from. About yeah. if you go and ride certain places, they'd be like, no, we oh, don't. It works, it's yeah, good. It does yeah. work, in a way, yeah, it yeah. works because it keeps them yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the no dig, no ride, like it can be seen as being a bit salty from the outside, but when you actually understand the graft that people put in, you know, in the hours they commit to it, you can totally understand it. Yeah, I think the best examples are of where communities are doing a great job of keeping up mountain bike trails is where they have created them themselves. You know, they generally yeah. like the off-piece trails, but there's there's loads of brilliant places around the UK that have been built by um, community riders and, and they informally look after them. 
yeah, yeah. but yeah. to try and apply it in that sort of more formal or official space is is really difficult yeah. yeah super hard so without owning the bike park that that was that was what you're trying to do you were trying to own one of your projects basically yeah for sure yeah for a number of reasons one is like so you can realize a vision you know it, it's not finished it's never finished yeah <laughs> you keep it evolving you keep progressing um i think running a, a effectively trail building company is a is a construction company and you never know where your next job is going so there was an element of that like some security as well yeah um but first and foremost it was like let's have control of this site and let's make it the very best it can be mm. how did what were those early conversations like with martin then how did you come together i don't think even martin spoke about this no, i might true, be wrong yeah. but like how did you help put together a plan how did you like yeah. show your vision how did you align yeah. it all so 2009 like I say when we started on that journey so we registered the company in 2009 and we opened in 2013 so it gives right. you an idea it's yeah, actually yeah, like yeah. a four-year process where we were kind of working towards that and we all had um, our own full-time jobs and interests yeah the initial vision was to build a downhill center. You know, that was the very start of it. It right. was, is much more uh, a simplified <laughs> version of bike park <laughs> Wales for sure. You know, not such a big fancy building, you know, basic, but with downhill. But it's good that we had those years because I think we could just see how things were changing in mountain biking. Like the bikes were evolving really quickly into yeah. proper trail bikes where everything didn't fall apart you yeah. know and you could ride stuff more aggressively um i just got happened to be doing a couple of um projects where we had to build i'd call them like some more progressive blue trails okay because all the trail centers up to that point were like reds and blacks so it was, it was actually one of the first proper blue trails in the forest of dean yeah. and then when that opened you saw oh my god how many people rode it really? you know all of a yeah. sudden it was like ah like light bulb mm. so yeah we kind of started thinking then okay we've still got this passion and background of sort of the downhill interest but we need to broaden it out and that's how it evolved like the vision if you like into um trail bike a trail bike focused gravity park I think yeah that's kind of how we were first talking about it um and then we just shared out the workload in terms of like putting together the plans and people played to their strengths yeah I think you spoke so, Martin and Anna spoke to yeah, that quite like, a lot. Yeah, like Anna's chartered accountant and she, you know, <laughs> financials, is not, that's not my <laughs> side of things. Like I've been running a company, you know, I could, I could run a small company and manage finances and that. But yeah, this was a whole nother world. Yeah. And we, we had, we were trying to get funding from all sorts of um, partners and we approached like um, a, a loaning bank in Wales. So I think they're called... Um, bank of wales or right. finance wales sorry so yeah there were some pretty hard um negotiations to do which needed a lot of like specific financial knowledge mm. so it's just people using their own strengths like my strength at that time was i'd the only put i was the only person who'd been involved in tenders right. because that was part and parcel of my right job yeah, at that yeah, point yeah, in time yeah, yeah. so i'd been doing tenders for like five years up to there so it's just kind of knowing how to put one together what the client might be looking for having a, a professional relationship with forest commission wales who are ultimately uh who we were bidding to mm. um so yeah we, we just used to meet in evenings like every <laughs> week after work and then just flesh out who's going to do what and just kind of chip away at it. Did you think it was going to happen? <laughs> I was going to ask that. Yeah. Um, We've all had these business ideas. Dude, I, yeah. we sat exactly. down, it's you've had the meetings. I was so yeah. invested when, Never uh, goes when anywhere. Martin Anna came <laughs> in. I was just like, I can, I can picture myself in the same yeah. position. Mm, yeah. Like. yeah. Oh, it's a great question. And I think I've been involved in you know, a number of different things over the years. But this is the one where because it was, it was an individual, it was a team, it was a collective with a clear vision yeah and i think whenever we doubted it and we all had like it was a massive roller coaster don't you wrong we all had like proper down days and like or <laughs> down weeks or whatever it would <laughs> yeah. be where you're like this isn't gonna happen we've got these barriers ahead of us but like someone else would be in a positive space and be like no we'll you know we'll so we just helped each other out and i think 
because of that and because of the amount of time and effort that we'd put into it there was no way it couldn't happen yeah like it was that's the only way i can put it yeah, that's it a cool way to happen. Yeah, yeah. Sick. we had to make it happen and but it we were obviously questioning at times whether it would happen on the basis that we were bidding against other people and we didn't know yeah. whether we'd be selected but once we were selected like we won the tender we still had a lot of hurdles to overcome massive ones um but there was never in question at that point it was like we just have to find a way and it was that was the challenge was finding the way this might be a stupid question but i was thinking about it after the episode with those guys like you were bidding against other people but how did that happen because you've had this idea totally separately yeah there's this piece of land how did other people get involved with the same piece of land yeah yeah it felt really tough on us it felt really harsh on us that that was the situation how did it get to that we were put into but essentially what happened is we 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 pitched the concept first first yeah like not long after probably 2009 i think you know Mm. not long after we got together we put together a plan and pitched it um and we had like a really good response and buy-in but it was then apparent which was only a good thing, but it was apparent that there was the potential of a grant, which would be public money right. um, to help support someone to do a commercial bike park. Okay. And it was that element specifically, I, I understand, that meant that it had to be oh, go out to the public. Right. So there is an alignment there of you having the idea and also the Forestry Commission who own the land also having a similar idea. So unbeknown to us at the time, there had been this um, feasibility study mm. that had been t- taking place within, for mountain biking within South Wales, which, yeah, we didn't know that was happening. We'd come <laughs> with our idea. But actually, this study had gone around and they'd spoken to all the interested parties. Um, so a number of riders, anyone like Dragon Down, Jason who's running Dragon Downhill, but, yeah, people who were involved in the sport and the industry. And they'd actually come back and said, there's a gap in the market. People want more extreme riding than you're providing. Like trail centers have a ceiling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People want to ride downhill. They want to do uplifts, blah, blah, blah. So they'd already been thinking about this and that is what had enabled the potential of this grant. Right. The two timing was, timing was pretty good. We yeah. had to wait, but it meant that the two aligned and then that meant that it had to go out and it, anyone could bid on that sort of concept that we'd pitch to them i guess it wow. turns into the same as like a roundabout or sort of set of swings as soon as it becomes public it's like <laughs> and you have to make it on. fair they have to uh, l- like get the best price get how the do best they put it out yeah, where do you that. see that stuff yeah and there are, there are sites where you can specifically yeah, I think look at there was like tenders uh whistle pe- no, uh, uh, select, select contracts i think there was uh, for. no in new zealand the company out there were yes. like interested. So like, how how would they see that yeah, there's this true, hillside yeah. in Wales that might be ready for developing? Like yeah, that. I mean, I can only assume like because this is how we do it within. The, I used to do it within the UK. Is you there are certain sites that list all tenders and opportunities. Got yeah, which could be everything from like retarmac in a pavement, traffic lights to building mountain bike track. Right. So you set up keyword searches on those um, notices. <sighs> And I would think a global company like yeah, that one, yeah. would just do it and they just they'll have it in each country feeding in. Was there an element of before you went started building the park through when you were planning it, were you keeping your cards like close to your chest? Were you telling people what you wanted to do? Or Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, you yeah. weren't yeah. like, talking about it down the oh, no, no. totally. It was the Because you were obviously building trails at the same time, yeah. so you're not gonna be like, Oh yeah, we're gonna do this really, thing in Wales. It was really difficult. Right. <laughs> it was really stressful and really hard because you didn't want to Yeah, exactly. You didn't you want don't to give someone else your ideas. Your cards, <laughs> but I'm also like a very open and honest person and like to sort of feel like you're slightly hiding something. Mm. I was it is just t- tough, but yeah. it's what we had to do because we wanted to win it, you know, and yeah, you, you could only share so much information. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> it's gnarly. <laughs> so when you won the tender, what was the first day? Or had you already planned the trails by, at that point? You'd already like roughly marked, was it seven? Yeah, 15? so there were like different stages. So I, yeah. to 
at the tender stage, I'd done a trail plan. Yeah. It's like an initial sort of concept trail plan. And it set out like how many runs we would have. But we ended up going way above that. Okay. Um, then once we were awarded it, I actually went in and sort of, because I knew at that point we had a year probably till we were building, mm -hmm. then spent a load of time on site and really fleshed out that plan with okay. further detail. Right. Okay. I and don't know if we asked before what the first trail was. Yeah. We should ask and people should put in the comments and then we'll reveal it after the break. What is that? That, my friend, is a two and a half thousand pound coffee machine Whoa. that you could be in with a chance to win if, simply if. Well, I can win all that. Yeah. Guess what the ticket price is. F what, to win all that? Yeah. The coffee machine. Coffee machine, grinder. The grinder. Scales. Scales, jug, mug, and a year's supply of coffee. Yeah. A year's Five. supply of coffee, I can't even see from here, but yeah. Yeah, it's there. It's great. Is it just, yeah, okay. 500 quid a ticket? Think again. Guess again. Higher. £590 a ticket. Okay, I'm going to stop you there because you're going up and we yeah. need to go down. We need to bring it right down. Oh. In a way, up in quality though because we're offering a ticket into this prize draw for every TRC pre-ride roast bag. Whoa. The pre-ride roast is back. The pre-ride roast is back and it's for 30... One second. Two. Yeah. 95 I thought you were going to say 320 no 32.95 okay. so pounds. the 32 pound 95 gets yep. me a kilogram of pre-ride roast yeah coffee that again we've gone in and made ourselves almost right absolutely it's a it's a mix of Brazil and Peru two favorite places for coffee absolutely you can buy it in every different format it's what beans ground exactly realistically you spend over you 40 quid a month probably on coffee as it is and the rest exactly I spend so much money 32 on coffee 32.95 is a steal and you get a chance to win this. Right. Do you wow. want to know how? Yeah, please. How do I do it? All you have to do is head to dreamcoffeecompetition.com and buy yourself a bag. Okay, so dreamcoffeecompetition.com, buy a bag of pre-ride roast, it gets shipped direct to your door. Yeah. And in. then that is my ticket to win two and a half grand's worth of coffee making, aesthetically pleasing beauty for yep. the kitchen. And it's, and it's known to make you look more sophisticated. If it's, anyone comes in your kitchen, I mean, game over, dude. Game over! Just having this in the room makes me feel sophisticated. Me too. Mate, no more like reused, not like, you know, plastic mugs, none of that stuff. Norton, head to okay. dreamcoffeecompetition.com and buy yourself some pre-ride roast. I'm going there now. Are you actually? Yeah, I'm off. It's online, dude. You don't need to leave the room. Okay, I'll come back. Nice one. Thanks, dreamcoffeecompetition.com. Thanks, dreamcoffeecompetition.com. Do you think we mentioned the website enough? <laughs> <laughs> We're on. We're back. So what was it? The first trail at Bike Park Wales? I'm pretty sure oh, can you it was know? six depart. <laughs> no, because depart, was there, there wasn't one. This is the thing. Ah. There were, we had a whole load of people working at the same time on different trails. So we didn't like yeah, build yeah, one yeah. trail from top to bottom. Got yeah. It's a trick answer. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So but but there was previously dragon races going through on That's right. Which one? You're trying was to it? pick the trail? Yeah, I can't yeah. remember. I know which one because I've got a punct I've gone all the way there, yeah. got a puncture and then didn't So have it's to. uh <laughs> Enter the Dragon. Enter the Dragon, that's top, what I'm thinking of. And then the bottom bit is deep navigation. Oh, is it? And Port Belly is actually the middle. So, like, there's three sections that make it up. Oh. Um, and we've obviously yeah. messed around with it, but we have kind of kept that rough footprint of it. There you go. I was th I was actually thinking what would be the first would be you go through the tunnel and you're at that little yeah. meeting point that people would stop at, and there's like the rocky one. Yes, that's what I remember so as being. That's the old rock garden from the Dragon yeah. track. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Was there more con? More people building then? You said that you built at the same time? Yes. You had more people to start with? Yeah, so we didn't have a trail crew then. Yeah. Yeah. So there were contractors or... Exactly, yeah. You. So we, we had a yeah contract team. Um, bikers or non-bikers? Mix. Because, <laughs> again, the industry wasn't as developed as yeah. it is now. Yeah. So that there wasn't like a pool of biker builders you could pull in. Right. Um, so we had a good mix. We had like quite a few 
really good trail builders mm. and skilled and riders and then we had a few people who never rode a bike in their life but they could do other things like that help us get that project along simple things like building the underpass you didn't need to you know the tunnel under yeah, the road yeah it didn't yeah. need to be a biker and, and putting in like our access tracks and okay yeah the, there was it was the biggest team I've had working on a site at one time. I think there was like at one point there was like fourteen trail builders, wow. all and a whole lot of plant and kit going yeah. at the same time. So yeah, it was pretty hectic. We had seven months to build the whole the whole of the trail network from you know day one to opening, and like context for that, we we put in. I think we opened with twenty six trails. Now, obviously, some of them are like sections, so it's not like 26 top to bottom runs, but it's, it's still a lot of trails. Yeah. Um, and a normal project we've been working on up until then would be maybe four or five months and you'd build like two tracks. Now, they're bigger tracks, but much easier, you know, yeah. cross country rather than like full of features and booms. So it was a new level of intensity, I think. Yeah. And at that point, you were building something that was like, obviously, it's your product. So did you want it to be, what, what, what were your primary concerns? Was it that it was all weather or was it that it was going to last or was it that it was super fun? What was it you were like, <laughs> aiming for the most? Trying to get a blend, yeah. I mean, the thing that kept me awake at night all the time was that it wasn't going to hold up and last. Right. So the ground was, is, is a real mix, mix match on that hill. Some sites you go to and the geology is all the same. So, you know, like if you dig here or you dig there, it's the same and you learn the properties of it and, and you're good. Yeah. Whereas it's very different in um, Gethin Bike Park Wales. So trying to understand like whether some of these soils we're getting to were going to just turn into swamps. You know, we yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. really know. Like experience can tell you so much, but normally you need a bit of time to get your head around it whereas we didn't have that we had yeah. to just open and be hit the ground running um so we definitely like surfaced some things which i'd have preferred not to but that was just to make sure it would hold up yeah um yeah so it was a balance of like trying to get the right style of trail and the right for want of a better word product uh, that people are going to love and people are going to enjoy riding versus something that's going to hold up and not find that it's a house of cards and after two months it's all collapsed in on you mm. i have no idea out of people listening to this how many people will have built a trail mm. i have no idea how much you think about it when you leave a like, comment if you've built a trail but I, I, <laughs> I go to a bike park and i do think about it doesn't it's not lost on me that every inch of the trail that you go along has been kind of put there or managed or like made mm. yeah um do you think it? Do you think that's something that's been lost, or do you think that's unimportant nowadays? I, th I think when people go there, you know, not a lot of people aren't going to be thinking about that. Like you, you guys had your experience with the teams, didn't you? And it, it's sort of, I guess, it's it gives you that window into it. It gives you that insight into like how much is involved in putting a track on the ground and and keeping it there. But it's not it's not important for our customers to know all of that. I mean, it's great, and it probably they get would have an appreciation of like what's involved if they knew it. What about for like mountain biking in general? Obviously, like on a personal level, you don't want anyone to have to like wheelbarrow dirt around to <laughs> in order to enjoy yeah. biking. But uh, okay, the reason I'm asking is I personally think it's got lost a little bit. I feel like it helps me knowing it stops me from inciting some of your turns. It like <laughs> I don't know. It just it, yeah. I I, I uh, look around and I feel like it has changed over the years. And like yeah. I think it's a good thing to pile up a landing. Yeah, because realize cause how long it takes and it takes so long. Yeah. like it uh, like fr from a kid, I've been piling up landings and. I understand why someone's mean to me if I chain ring one. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're no longer mean. They're just they yeah. piled up the landing. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. Like, like with the trail center vibe, sometimes that people are just like, "Oh, I've paid to ride here, so I'm just gonna almost do whatever I want." But you've kind of got to limit that, haven't you? Yeah, I guess the trails have got to be like adapted so that that's not happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I I, I totally agree. I think you get that like a sense of appreciation when you've done it. Don't mm. you? Yeah, you appreciate what's which is great fun involved. as well. It's good feeling that wherever you ride whether it's yeah. yeah bike park or sort of like local trails or you know definitely dirt jumps you know to the graph that people put in and it's always a small group of people you know i think 
yeah it is inspirational to see what some people do in yeah their spare i feel time. like the um the experience we had should be something that you open up to like that's great punters. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. they could come for the day yeah it's like a day's trail building gives you a free day on the hill one day or something like that <laughs> they've, they've got to have a night out with the trail crew <laughs> yeah i don't know about that because <laughs> <laughs> you guys didn't we didn't we do a night time. out with the boys no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a good team yeah no doubt so when you were starting to build all of the uh, trails early days did you then were you also doing the other stuff as well you know there's so much more going on outside of bike like park wales planning buildings services that's going in all that oh sort of so stuff. yeah yeah um yes but we did delegate out um so we could focus in on like core responsibilities so thankfully once the build started you know prior to the build we were all kind of involved in everything to some mm. extent mm. Um, but when we actually broke ground and started building, like Anna and Liz looked after the um, visitor center itself and sort of trying to manage that contractor there. Yeah. Um, Martin was leading slightly more on the the legal side and our lease negotiation, um, you know, as well as having oversight of the buildings. And I would focus more on everything outside of the building. So right. Uplift Road, getting that built. Um obviously the trail network the underpass the tunnel yeah so yeah we did blinker a little bit through that period mm. and then we got to operational phase when we opened our doors were you there on that first day yeah yeah yeah, yeah it was 1500 wild. people yeah. or something it, yeah <laughs> it's something we'll um yeah we'll never forget definitely because it was such a long build-up um and i think they touched on it before but yeah we were there like midnight the night before and it's pitch black and it's just a very surreal feeling there's no one else there just us because all the contracts have gone home and then we're like it's happening you know tomorrow is the day yeah and we hit our date I and mean, you know that was a milestone in itself because we set a target date and we advertised it and there's always a risk we wouldn't get there like seven so, months prior as well uh no i think we decided we gave ourselves a little bit of wiggle room, but we still committed like three or four months out. So it could oh, all have, could all have gone yeah, wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, hit the date and then morning came round. And yeah, it was just that feeling of being completely overwhelmed by what was happening, but also a sense of excitement that it, people are it's into there. it. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like it's not just a pipe dream. It's like people want this. And by the, by the number of people who came through the door and also just like chatting to people and seeing the buzz that was there. Mm. It was a real buzz, yeah. So it, that, that was a pretty exciting day. Sick. So day one, what were people excited about in terms of trail building? Because you've talked about flat turns and like adding berms. It seems obvious now, but like yeah. it wasn't necessarily obvious all those years ago. But what about at the start of Bike Park Wales? Which trails were super exciting to people? Was there any... Yeah. surprises there in what the general population liked yeah i think people were enjoying the fact that you had a diverse collection of trails together right like i that's what i was picking up is like the buzz that they could go and ride something like pretty gnarly like nothing super gnarly but like steep yeah. and tech and then just have the most cruisy fun you know massive train with riders on a blue yeah. Um, and, and probably the blues are the things that stood out because like that style of fast flowy blue was was new you know I think that is really the place that sort of put put that style on the map um, mm. in the UK anyway so yeah I think people were loving that because everyone could ride them like yeah. they were accessible so like anyone who went there could have a go but you you'd have you had people sending it down there you know whether you're a racer or a hooker or whatever it was accessible to everyone I found it. I've just got back from Savinia. Have you been to um, Mount Pika or Petson? Yeah. Petson. No, I haven't. Trail. I, I followed your trip though, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, so that flow trail really blew my mind because obviously you see blues being popular. But this blue, this blue, this trail, it's 20 minutes probably long. Wow. Flow trail. It's a big yeah. mountain. But you have everyone, you have a guy on a, a fat bike, uh, you have a, a kid. On a on a like a sixteen inch wheel bike, and then you have us going as quick as you can. And it, it blows my mind mm. that you, that that's like possible, and that is a blue 
mm-hmm. trail. It's like a true blue trail. It's not a, it's not yeah. difficult, but it's super fun. Like That's that wouldn't cool. have happened without. No, I no, no. Rounds, rollers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think. That's that whole development of flow trails, isn't it? You know, that's that's come about. You know, it's been in the last ten years, really. Those going out across Europe, well, and the world. Yeah, but they're yeah, they're super fun. You you don't want to just ride that. Yeah, but with everything else, they're great. Yeah, totally. I met Diddy Schneider the other day. Okay, yeah, he's quite a he's quite a flow trail forefather, isn't he? Yeah, that's definitely yeah. He's done a lot of good work, I think. So with that, with, with the flow trails and with the progression from flat turns, berms, flow trails, whatever, where do you see see it going next in terms of like mountain bike trail design? I feel like bikes have kind of leveled off a bit. Mm-hmm. Where would you say is the area you'd like to explore the most in trail building? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I think there's still just like the little avenues and niches that sit, you know, you like, for us uh, certainly at bike park wales we're looking at filling those gaps in progression so you can literally just smoothly step your way up you haven't mm. got to go from medium sized jumps to really big jumps you know you, you just give people that ladder um so i think that's something we'll focus on but in terms of stuff that'd be different like i'm quite excited about doing a proper e-bike loop Ah, nice yeah. there you go right yeah i was gonna ask you about that That's so what defines a proper e-bike loop <laughs> i'm intrigued for me is the one currently at yes. bike park wales no anywhere no. in the uk <sighs> that we could dan, say is an e-bike loop i know dan at derby has one that people are riding but i don't think it's yet in a place where um, it's open. Yeah, I was going to say, if yeah, it's that, well, and like, <laughs> it's obviously going to be loud. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people who rode it, and everyone says it's real good. But yeah, yeah it's it's hard, you know. Yeah. But that's cool, you know. There's going to be a core of people who want to ride that. Mm. Um. So, but yeah, I don't think there is one yet that's open. Um. People are just either doing, you know, they're off piece riding with yeah. e-bikes, or they're probably buzzing around trail centres and bike parks. Yeah. But yeah, I got a kind of vision to do something at the bike park, which unfortunately probably won't be for you know a few years out. But it'll be steep, techy climbs, you know, just like a challenge on the way up, so you're fully engaged. Mm. You're not just like chilling up, and then proper downs, like steep, techy downs, and okay. up and down. So it'll be a loop, like a cross country circuit. Yeah. but with five or six climbs and descents on it. That's cool. That's and exactly what I new. thought you were going to say. Yeah. And mm. what I would say is an e-bike loop as and well. And pretty like natural. Thursburg. And probably the future, like you yeah, just said, I, like this, yeah. that's what it is, surely, right? Like people are going to be riding e-bikes more, it looks like, in the future, whether it's an SL or a full fat. Yeah. Oh, without So you've got to yeah. accommodate for it. Yeah. And it opens up terrain that we can't use now. Yeah. So we've... We, our current plan to build a lot more trails in the park, they're still focused in the same zone that we've got so we kind of increase the number of trails there um and it's uh, yeah really excited about that it's, it's going to be brilliant um but the e-bikes allow us to go places we can't currently with the uplift yeah, yeah. um and unlock little bits of terrain so I've, I've rode and explored all like the backside of the hill which won't work off an uplift uh, and there's some really good like features like old quarries and yeah just different terrain to play does with. it get harder there obviously because you're going to want people there as a client customer paying the insurance all that sort of stuff if you've got a bigger loop it adds more complications to who's paid and who's not yeah. and who's covered and it, who's not and it adds definitely adds complications for us yeah. um a lot of them are just in management of the land right so we increase the spread of our staff and the area that they're responsible for yeah so at the moment you can draw a ring around it and yeah. you, you basically double that okay which the big one is obviously first aid response and medical care, which is something we put a lot of like pride and effort yeah, into, yeah, as, yeah. as you guys as have we witnessed. Found out, yeah, yeah, but um, that could be challenging. You know, if we've got to respond to someone who's completely the other side of the hill, mm. um, it's already you know a little bit of a challenge. So, so stuff we have got to work through, um, but the concepts there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the future of bike parks being e-bikes i bet you never saw that coming <laughs> i think it's an important part like people will always want uplift yeah you know, and and when e-bikes became started getting popular like i was an early adopter 
like I had a Trek or a sponsor so I, I had a bike through Trek really early on when they weren't like great at that time but yeah. straight away I was like wow these have got something about Tough them it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I didn't think I was going to like them you know if I'm honest I was like right I, was, I wanted to not like them yeah. and then I was like oh. and now they've, they've got so good they're really, you know I think they're brilliant um but yeah we started seeing lots and lots more e-bikes coming and in our head we're like okay what does that mean for an uplifted bike park mm. but now it's been there long enough that we kind of get it and if you live to a couple of hours away from bike park wales or Dovey or or black mountains you know any of those uplifted places revs and your local riding suits having an e-bike like most people are changing to an e-bike you know a lot of people are so that's their solo bike so when they come to a bike park it's still like their day out at a bike park and they're on the uplift so yeah. you see them a lot at any of the parks now we're seeing um, which is quite interesting because it took a while to get your head around it because you're like <laughs> well these guys are putting e-bike on the uplift are they being lazy but it's not it's just like that's your your bike one bike garage, so you probably, use yeah. it how, to, according to where you are yeah i mean you've already got the climb as well haven't you like it's there as an option yeah for it's anyone it's much yeah. cheaper isn't it it's uh yeah yeah i think what we uh, what i think we've learned or what we see is if people live within an hour of the bike park so it's kind of local then they're much more likely to just ride the e-bike yeah you know they might do the occasional uplift um whereas as soon as you flip it the other way and you're it's, it's a bit of a trip to go to bike park mm. i've pedaled loads uplift. of times at your bike park yeah yeah i think it was just through not being able to get on the uplift okay and just turning up and then just yeah yeah just pedaling up it's a good day out for pedaling you know but yeah. i think you know uplift is it's the thing that most people want and most people come for yeah 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 i mean it, you can get actually get way more laps in than you think it, d it does make you think doesn't it with e-bikes because I, on a normal bike i think i got seven laps in one day it's by no means the record but it was like a big day i'm sure people have done way more but that was like quite a big day and quite yeah. quite a good uh, day on the tools kind of thing <laughs> and then on a on the uplift you sort of get 10 or 12 don't you or yeah like a, a really good day on the uplift would be 13 yeah i think 10 solid like most people would makes you think on an yeah. e-bike I might have to yeah. come and do a YouTube video. That's so, that sounds like a YouTube title. I just, as I was about to say it. <laughs> yeah. How many laps can I do at Bio Park? Yeah, because I guess you're bar battery limited as well, aren't you? Like, Take two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> E-bikes at bike parks. Yeah, interesting. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. So how much work do you do outside of Bike Park Wales now? Are you solely just Bike Park Wales would do? Uh, I'm more or less solely Bike Park Wales these days. Yeah. So... Um, it was around COVID, I kind of had a reflection on trying to do two things. It was really tough. Mm. You know, um, so on track, the trail building company, I've been working with James and Rob for a long, long time now. They're sort of like my two core staff who've been on the journey with me. And um, I just kind of recognised that I was probably holding them back. Okay. You know, you, you, you do two things badly rather than one thing well. Yeah. So, yeah, I had the conversation with them. I, last thing I wanted to do was kind of lose all the uh, the good work that we put in over the years and just... And these are full-time staff, sorry. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, wind yeah. the company. So, that, so they now own the company. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I'm involved, but, you know, much more in the background. Yeah. They give me a shout if they want any help, any sort of signboarding, and if there's a particular project, um, I might get involved in, like, a specific project. But day-to-day... It, it runs itself and wow. yeah like i say james and rob do you know rob breakwell i don't know whether you'd have yeah. met him yeah he used, he used to race he used to race for dirt magazine back in the day yeah but yeah so he's he's one of the owners cool rad so you built it up to a point and then you can almost just sort of take a bit of a step back and then yeah yeah because they they've developed so much yeah. through that time um yeah and as i say i just kind of recognized that trying to be fully involved in bike park wales and the trail building company going mm. forward was was not the best result for anyone yeah yeah and yeah, yeah i'm not getting any younger i want to spend my free time riding my bike not <laughs> sat at a laptop it's fair you know six, fair. So it was often six seven days a week when it was busy so yeah. yeah nice so you've got the dream bike park you also have the dream yard 
your yard. I've <laughs> yeah. never been. I want to so bad. I've heard you're, so many stories. Yeah, you're very welcome. It'd be great to have you. How yeah. did that happen? <laughs> uh, how did it happen? It, I guess it was always, like, for a lot of us, it's, it's a bit of a pipe dream, isn't it, to have a few jumps Big in time. your garden or a pump track. So I, I've always thought that. I just wanted somewhere where I could build a few dirt jumps and know they're not going to get knocked down. Yeah. And then me and my fiance then, my, my wife now, we were sort of, we were looking to move and we'd been house hunting, if you like, but just keeping a north eye. No desperate yeah, like, yeah. need to move. We're just keeping an eye out, going and visiting places, doing drive-bys, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, this place came up um, and it was a year before we started building Bike Park Wales. So perfect timing. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> like it was an absolute nightmare. But yeah, so I, we went and viewed it. I walked through the door and by this point we'd already viewed a load of different houses and um, I kind of had a feeling for like what Liz did and didn't like and kind of opened the door. I was like, well, this isn't going to happen. It's like, it just needed way too much work. And we said with Bike Park Wales around the corner, we didn't want to take a project on. But I said, oh, could I have a look at the land? And the, um, the owner was there and he said, oh, yeah, I'll walk you around and like walk through this field and into these woods. And like all of a sudden I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the brain's going like, <laughs> so yeah, came back down, didn't say anything because you're in front of the owners. It's always a bit awkward. We jumped in the van, drove out and I was like, what do you think? And I was just <laughs> waiting for Liz to go, oh, no, I don't like that. And she goes, oh, I love it. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just totally wasn't expecting it. So we went, anyway, long story short, went back to the second view in. We were both getting our heads around the house side of it then and took it on as a project. So yeah, that was another thing. Whilst we were building Bike Park Wales, we were trying to renovate this house, but with a long-term aim of obviously putting some tracks there. Getting so it took, the took a while. It's like we've been there for 12 years now and put the first tracks in the year after. So it's like been 11 years of like building and tweaking and you've got some massive jumps in your garden haven't you really yeah there's a couple of big ones yeah no actually way. like this yesterday was the first time i hit a few of the bigger jumps since i'd like remodeled them and stuff yeah. so yeah it's nice it's like anything you know like you, you've got to tick it off you know yeah so like they're all yeah. ticked off now and yeah have some sessions in the summer so yeah Whoa. definitely you should come up and ride that it. feels like a busman's holiday though you're like building trails all day, going home, <laughs> yeah. build some more trails in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it is, but yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> and and when we moved there, it, it was slightly different then. So I, I ran back on track or on track as it is now from that um, address. Right. So we had a like a lock up for the diggers and uh, an office <laughs> that the staff worked from. So the trail it became like. Well, you could come and visit. This is what we could do. Yeah, yeah. It was oh, like an wow. advertising board. So we actually like the Showroom. job. The job in Ireland. Well, we had two jobs from Ireland, but they're Glenn Cullen. The guys came over and they, they had a walk around. And yeah, so it, it kind of just shows it's a really small piece of woodland and land. But I think we've been really creative with it. And right, we've got yeah. a lot in there. So yeah, I'd be, really, I'd be stoked to show you it. Like it's, I think um, most people come in and they're like, ah oh. because it's <laughs> yeah. yeah it's just like over the years we've been able to really get the best out of that space yeah that's cool bro. so you can look out the window and see big jumps is it literally like see that? if yeah 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 we got like a little lawn and then it rolls it's like a little valley yeah so it's like a big step down to a step up out of this valley so yeah you can see that out the window that's, that is that's the dream, dope isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's cool man the showroom in the garden but it's a lot of work that's the thing you don't appreciate i didn't appreciate yeah. you know i was just like oh that'll be amazing yeah. but actually it's a big old job, like keeping on top of it when it's not being ridden all the time. And to get people to come and ride it, isn't it? Because you obviously you don't want people just hanging out in your garden. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but like then also you don't want to be like super formal with like yeah, yeah, inviting true. people yeah, over yeah. to ride your massive jumps. <laughs> yeah. Sam always talks to me about it. Sam, we've got Veros are going to get used like for a while. Wow, that um, is quite some that's garden. Quite that a garden. Looks incredible. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's just it doesn't look like it's pop. in the UK. No, you know, it, look, no. it looks like something you expect to see somewhere else for yeah. some reason. But yeah, it's nice, looks isn't it? incredible. Everyday session in the garden. Pretty cool. It's really weird. Yeah, cool. Andre's got quite a wild setup as well, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah. I'm trying to think of all of the backyard setups because yours mm. is one that comes to mind because you've had it for a while as well. Yeah. And because of the TTR track. The motor, well, some of the motor stuff's yeah. like really cool in the States. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Twitch and Maddo's places, places like that. Oh, dream, really. 
Dream. It is, isn't it? Um, it is. <laughs> so it's quite a vague question. But what's the current state of like trail building in the UK? I think a massive topic is always like advocacy, building legal spots. Like I'd love to know from a professional what are your views on it and what should people be doing to try and rally to get legal trails, etc. Yeah. I just love uh, any of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think sure. You're the right person. Yeah, to I think it's a re- it. it's like a really interesting time at the moment for for all of that space. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk in that sphere for for years and years, but but just now there's like a sort of well of momentum mm. and a few um, different people and bodies kind of involved in, I guess, trying to help uh, facilitate like community groups and, and local rider groups yeah, break down some of the barriers with landowners and move from very informal spaces to like semi-formal or slightly more formal spaces. So yeah, yeah my kind of take is I think it's it's got to be a healthy thing because mm. um, if you look at places around the world where it's been done well, it works. Um, Squamish, Pemberton, I was, there are places I've, been to and sort of could say that it feels like they do do it really well so okay. they're like they have um community groups which have official um contracts and links to the landowners yeah yeah um, so it's all like it's it's formally managed but in a community-led way it's kind of like what i see where i live like sheffield we've got ride sheffield and uh, and there's another one as well can't remember the name of but again they are in touch with landowners they're sort of like maintaining trails as well which is really cool yeah so even if it's one that's like a public one that's been sort of put there i'm thinking of there's one called lady cannings which is quite quite yeah, sort of quite that. famous where i am but again that's maintained by volunteers and every month or two they go up there patch things up but i was just curious like yeah what was going on with the state of it and yeah so yeah. That, like i said there's these two groups who are who are now trying to coordinate so, so rather than every group whether it's in sheffield in South Wales or in like the Tweed Valley, mm. all having to have their own conversations and kind of unpick all these barriers, which can be really difficult because you, you're dealing with, especially if you're dealing with public bodies, so like Forest Commission, for example, yeah. or NRW, there's a lot of red tape. And sometimes they'll ask for things which I think are probably a bit unreasonable of a, of a volunteer group. Mm. Um, so I think we're at the start of that journey, but... Um, these projects so SRAM are sponsoring one so they've employed an officer to help um, okay. kind of coordinate in the UK yeah right yeah um, and then there's uh, another chap Robin who's kind of um, set up off his own back uh, um, a forum for all of these rider groups that he's, he's contacted from around the UK so whether that be like Tepentuous Risk Riders um, I'm sure some of the chef groups yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and he's got He's telling me over a hundred different groups. That's cool. There's over a hundred groups, contact, which is amazing in the UK. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, like I say, we're at the start of that journey. But I think if they can make that headway and break down some of the barriers with landowners, then it's got to be good for everyone because the landowner can be that their their concern is liability. Yeah. So as a landowner, you can't um, negate that landowner's liability. So if someone goes down a trail. You know, worst case scenario, they break their neck or something severe or they, or they have fatality. There's always the potential of a comeback on that landowner. Mm. It's not as simple as to say, it's mountain biking, you do it as your own risk. Yeah. And it's tough, you know, and that, we, we face that within a bike park and it's, it's hard for those landowners to have a very laissez-faire attitude because that's... Yeah, if it was your land, you'd feel exactly the same. Are with. Yeah. So I think if we can put them in a place where they're more assured because there's processes in place, like mm. the design is checked off, they're inspected, they're maintained, you know, like basic steps, then that will help and yeah. not barriers. And then I think for the community groups, it's just like some simple rules of operating and, and, and rules of engagement with those landowners. So, And the public as well, I think, a lot as a mountain biker and someone who goes out and uses these places, it's like it's just important to just be a, decent person and not take the piss yeah and i think like the the knock-on effect especially with the exactly i was gonna say like your hat says don't be a dick i mean it's like you know a lot of what we've seen with the growth of biking especially like post-covid it's like it's just got a bit out of control and even from someone who goes out and rides a lot you 
there's certain areas and you're just like, come on, just yeah. don't be a dick. Like you don't have to ride that spot there that's like in, you know, an iconic bit of scenery, for example. Yeah, yeah, for it doesn't sure. need a trail down it. Like yes. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's raising awareness because I think there's there's two sides. There's people who are being dicks. Yeah. And you know, they're knowingly doing it. Yeah. And then there's maybe some younger riders who are just you know, they're not aware. Just of naive to it. Yeah, they're just searching for loans. They're now. being dicks too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it can help, like, bridge all those gaps. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we're in a good space in that change feels like it's coming mm. um, for the positive. But I also understand, completely understand, like, certain groups who want to stay under the radar and do their own thing because it's, as it is now, it's very difficult to, like, make that contact with, the Forest Commission, you know, they're the biggest landowners. That's probably the best example. And say, we we want to build these trails or we've got these trails. How can we manage it? It's, it's, it's tough, you know. So I think it's all about making that process easier so that it works for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And it'll come. Um, I thought that Squamish as well. I thought, and I, I even spoke to someone about the clubs and the groups and how it works. And it doesn't seem to be limited, does it? No. Not at all. Not well, when you ride their trail network. It's, yeah. it's mega. What I wonder is whether it's because of quite literally just space. Maybe. There's a lot more pressure more on it. land here, obviously. Yeah, yeah we've got you know, a lot of users in more confined spaces, yeah. for sure. But um, that's about having those conversations and agreeing where is appropriate to like, yeah. have those trails. Yeah, yeah, totally. You can't have them everywhere. No. It's f- yeah, when, when you go somewhere with more space, I was in Slo- Slovenia a- again the other day and talking about it, and it was like all of these problems weren't sorted out with contracts, they're sorted out with like salami and wine. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But as soon as there gets so yeah. many people, you sort of actually just have to. It's no, like... Yeah. I remember being younger and being so annoyed. That you oh, I know. Knocked down my jumps. Oh, 100%. Like, once you get it, you're like... oh. Yeah, I haven't moved closer to <laughs> understanding <laughs> what the solution is, but <sighs> you understand. I do get it. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Uh, it's, mm. it's interesting. It's an interesting hobby for that, isn't it? Yeah, because you're sort of in search of the untouched stuff and the fun stuff that's not. Yeah, it's kind of what it is. A lot of it. Yeah, <laughs> so so much of it. Yeah. yeah, that's the gold we're all looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it. Yeah, it, there is a limit, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. and as the sport gets bigger, there's more and more people doing it. There has to be like a bit of an element of control. Yeah, for sure. Um, we touched on the stripes. Yeah. So <laughs> how difficult is it just 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 mentioning that you've got rainbow <laughs> stripes and then just sort of leaving it with you like <laughs> fine. feels a bit <laughs> talk a little about bit that awkward then. <laughs> talk about that then. <laughs> so you're world champion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been. Um, what actually we, okay let's unpick it so what's been your riding journey throughout all of this stuff with bite pot whales have you always continued to yeah ride a lot or is, is there ever um, been a point downhill where, enduro yeah. what we yeah there, there was times where I, I couldn't yeah uh, and and that was either because we were just under the cosh you know head down our set working so kind of riding had to go on the back burner for a, a while um but i always consider myself like I'm a rider first and like business second, but okay. I just had to flip it for those years of my life, knowing that, you know, this is what we wanted to achieve. Mm. So I couldn't wait to get back to like spending time on the bike. So as soon as I could, I was back to riding. And I've always done like downhill is what I grew up doing. But as soon as trail bikes became a thing and yeah, I love trail biking. It's like enduro yeah. class because you're getting a lot of the, the fun of downhill and you're out riding with your mates for longer. It's class. But um, the journey's been rough. I've got to be honest. <laughs> like the injury, I've had a lot of injuries. Have you really? Yeah. Career. What yeah. sort of injuries have we had? I feel like famously you've had a lot of. Yes. Injuries. Again, it's sort of like embarrassingly. <laughs> no, famously. I don't. No, you're real but, deal, Rowan. I think <laughs> yeah. it's not something to be embarrassed of. But I, you know, I am kind of. I'm proud of like coming back from them because there's been a few where it's been like. You know, another yeah. one or like what really? What are we talking? What's biggest injury on the? Uh, well, I've broken sheet. my legs five times. Um, yeah, wow. I've had like 20, 20 fractures and a few ligaments and 
tore my spleen and yeah so it's been from 15 to now yeah, yeah like big gaps but since by injuries park wales, <laughs> it's been like a run <laughs> like literally like we when we were building bike park is one the big injury but obviously kept me off bike for a bit i uh was testing one of the jumps on zoo and jumped into a bomb hole and it's all still fresh so we hadn't like compacted it all out and a loose like loaded up in the bottom and a, a plate of rock flicked up off my pedal and i just put my big toe like square into it and it just blew my toe up properly blew it up uh, so that's where it started <laughs> yeah and then um that's yeah i did my tip at the bike town. park yeah had to have uh uh, have you seen like the cages? Yeah, oh, yeah man, so yeah. I've I lived with one of those for five months. Did you? Yeah, yeah. and uh, my wedding date basically <laughs> it was looking like my wedding date was gonna be I was gonna have to go down the aisle with this <laughs> blue belt kaplunk on my leg, as I call it. But uh, yeah, I literally had it off like three days before the, the wedding, so that was a big relief. Um, I bet walking was weird down the aisle. Not feel yeah, careful. It was, yeah, yeah, because I just be, you, you sort of bang that into door frames and stuff because you just, yeah, it gets a bit clumsy. Um, but not long after that came off, God, it was probably like three months later. So we got married, got that, thankfully that happened. But when they put that thing on your leg, so it's it's got like wires going through it, which actually hold all the brakes in place because I shattered my lower leg, so it was in like five or six pieces. But they, fix it into your shim into your tibia yeah. so it's like really barbaric and crude they just get like an m6 and go and like that bolts it in to your leg <laughs> and i've been after i've been riding i've had this like one point where i was like that's oh, a little bit pain sore at that point but i just figured that's just because it's gonna be. yeah, yeah it's gonna be carried on riding carried on riding and then just had like a, a little stamp one day i wouldn't call it at all a big stamp it's just like fat um, where the bolt had been, it just snapped in half. I hadn't filled. It just... Yeah, oh. yeah. So, <laughs> so I then went back into a cage for another five months. Oh, ten months yeah. in a cage. Until... So, why was I telling you that? Yeah. So injuries. Are, that's how the stripes came about. That's why we're talking about it. So, you earned your stripes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Now I, you can like you don't have to feel guilty about telling us how you're a world champion. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. It was like, deserved them. Yeah. I just deserved them. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I did my ACL. I did my ACL, and I just before it, I just got a new. I changed downhill bike, so I just started riding a bit of downhill. And then you know when you have like a more significant injury, you're kind of thinking about what you know. You just want to get back on the bike, but you're also. Yeah. I, I need like something to aim for, whatever it is, whether it's oh, a trip sick. or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I done my ACL, and then. I'd read that the Masters World Champs was in Patagonia. Yeah. That following season. Somewhere you want to go. Yeah, I've always wanted to go to Patagonia. I was like, fuck, that would be amazing. So that that's how it came about. Like, that became the focus. So I did motivated. loads of rehab. Like, yeah, worked really hard. Went out, did that event. Just happened to be probably the sickest downhill track I've ever ridden in my life. Is it really? Unreal. Yeah. And you know, like how um, the World Cup in Poland, everyone was complaint not complaining. Like, yeah, they were bitching basically that it yeah. looked shit. Yeah, yeah by the far, we sure. watched the head cam. It was a little bit like that. Like, I watched the head cam. I was like, it didn't look shit, but yeah. I watched the head cam. I was like, it's Patagonia. I'm still going to go, but yeah. the track doesn't <laughs> yeah. look the best. And you get there, and you're like, how were those two things even the same? It was like so steep and yeah it's just basically a sick track but it oh, didn't look really, good on the yeah, head cam yeah. and i guess that's a bit like the poland thing instagram versus reality but yeah. opposites so <laughs> so i went out did that did that race and yeah i mean luck luck won it it was it was awesome yeah it was, it was a good comeback and then and then i broke my leg the next year and i just ended up on this cycle for three years now where i've had an injury and I was like, well, I might as well set the same it's target. Major world champion, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's been cool. Like, and also, when I, if I travel or do any like a race like that now, I love traveling, you know. So I'll just be like, well, I'm going to go on holiday and I'm going to go and explore that area and just make the most of going somewhere anyway. And the riding, whatever happens, happens, yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. So how many times have you won it? Three on the bounce. Three on the bounce. Yeah. Three <laughs> times world ass. champion. Are you, be- are you beating out people you used to look up to as well? Like, is that... Yeah, yeah, a couple. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's Call them out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Pascal Canals, like, I've been... Ra- I've raced him at the last... I've, I've, I've raced him at all three. And he was someone I used to race against in World Cups. And he would always pretty much always smoke me um you know that's the thing it's, it's put cool, in perspective you know yeah. right racing masters is nothing like doing uh you know a world champs a bit like or, it. or racing a world cup <laughs> elite but it's still a good crack still and, and uh, yeah. you've got boys who used to do the world cups like tommy misser was at this one he's like an old school world cupper from like the Vulios era and stuff um yeah and i went to the one in there was one at val de sol like a few years back Went to that and the guy, I'm trying to remember, Jonesy did it, did it, Mike. And the guy who won his category was uh, an overall World Cup winner. Oh, wow. Carrado oh, wow. Herring. That's yeah, his name. I remember so him. I remember a sticker you, of him. Yeah. On a Sintessi. Like, this is proper old, <laughs> old downhill trivia now. Yeah. So, yeah, he actually lives near, he designed Val de Sol, the original track. Wow, there you oh, go. Yeah, that's like his local area. Right. So, we're going to have. Mm. Um, probably a lot of people listening to this who are going to be of similar age yeah so what are the secrets to being masters world champ what's training look like uh, other than the injuries yeah they're not a, <laughs> you don't need them <laughs> you don't you don't want to have to have an injury to give you that motivation <laughs> do you have to have a world-class um bike park and uh, <laughs> jumps in your garden or would you say it's not a necessity <laughs> definitely not a necessity <laughs> a bike shop um <laughs> You'll hear this a lot, <laughs> but a lot of the people who work at the park, like Martin, will be the same. Like me and him, actually, we don't ride the park that much, you know, considering how much we're there. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Whenever I do, I, I, have a, I love it, you know, I have a great time. But yeah, it's not like we're on it all the time. Um, but no, yeah, there is definitely some training. Yeah. Go on, Try to keep myself in decent shape. Yeah. I think that's just good as you get older anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's normally been like strength and conditioning stuff because of an injury, and mm. then that just feeds into, um, yeah, being in good shape then for for a downhill run. Yeah, I mean that's why I like downhill. It's not enduro. <laughs> I'm not fit like in that way. Okay, I, I can't like sprint, you know, really, long yeah. distance and okay. yeah. I love like trail riding, but yeah, at the sharp end, I'm not fit enough for that. Fair. I don't know sure you probably are <laughs> sure you're playing it down a little bit i don't know yeah i, I enjoy <laughs> it no no it's there's levels in there yeah yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Totally. there's the ceiling is high in that game yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's true could be the first world champ on the podcast though oh my goodness could be i'm sure you'll better it <laughs> I'm trying to think now it's yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe could be I'll take that though. Yeah, yeah I would. I would. Yeah. You can sign the board, board world champ. <laughs> yeah, that'd be. <laughs> Number Got one. to sign it, champ. That'd be good. <laughs> so, what's next for Bike Park Wales? I feel like it's a nice question to end on. Mm. What's next for you with Bike Park Wales? Where yeah. do you see it going? It's really exciting that. We've just today actually we've now got that new lease is is kicked in. No way. So, yeah, yeah. Got like on the way down. Yeah. Got the message. You so literally it. found out today. So that is yep. That. Yep. This morning. So wow. It's been like six years of work for Congrats. for me and Mark well, and all of us really to to get that over the line. Um, but what that means is a lot of the stuff that Anna and Martin spoke about can now kick in. Um, yeah, and for me personally, it's leading on that trail development. So oh, wow, it's yeah. exciting because I do have to deal with a lot of paperwork and red tape to get there. Yeah. But like starting Wednesday, hopefully this week. So in a couple of days time, we'll break ground and we'll start building wow. our first track. So this is like the day the podcast comes out, which will be this yeah. Wednesday. You make yeah, the hopefully start. we will be dig a bucket in the ground. Wow. Yeah. So couple of exciting. little things. So Super I'm, exciting for you. Really exciting, yeah, yeah, like genuinely really exciting. Are you allowed to talk about what people can expect from these new trails? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we like the, the big plan, we've got, like, we're ticking all the boxes, hopefully. You know, we, we've got another green trail within the long-term plan right through to, you know, the black 
downhills and, and jump lines. But what we're going to go out and do first, the very first thing we're doing is like a, a cool blue flow trail, which will link up the middle of the park into the tunnel. So it's just kind of like a missing link at the moment. Okay. But it's, it's going to be like a, a six section as well. So that's the first thing we're doing. Then we're going to, have you rode Boom Slang? Did yeah. you ride that one? Yeah. So at the minute, fun trail, but it just like, stops and then you're on the fire road and then you've got to either go up or down so it's always a plan to have bottom section to that okay. so we're going to put that one in next so you can do top to bottom runs on boom slang uh and then we're going to go red uh, like a big top to bottom red tech trail okay um which will go from the south start area down to the uplift uh and then we're into jumps then we've uh we're gonna fill out like i said earlier, filling out some of the gaps in progression so we got pop to ping, which is our easier jump line. Then you go up to sort of A470. And it's quite a jump, mm. especially because A470 is really progressive. Starts easy, but gets hard. So we're going to like soften that progression. Um, same at the top end. We'll have some bigger jumps here going from red to black. Um, and a little skills area. That's something that's coming soon. So wow. we'll be working on that in the skills, next couple of what, months. And what does the skills area involve? So we can't do... Um, we can't have a big, massive... Sk- like, some places have really good skills areas, I'd say, where yeah. they've got a really big site. And it's almost like a a little mini bike park in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but we've packed the area with so many trails. We, we don't have that space around the building. But what we have got is this um, disused quarry up at the top, which is near where Popty Ping starts, uh, Blue Jump Line. And it's really cool in that it's got a lot of, like, quite natural sort of rock rolls, changes in elevation, drops... Um, and it's quite confined. So we're just going to expand that out. It's going to be some sort of beginner rollers, beginner jumps, um, drop-offs, techie climbs, and some really good, like, drop-in sort of rock rolls. So you're nice. like, And they'll be graded out. So, you know, you start with, like, a red one, go up to black, and then there'll be a pro line where you've got a couple of bigger drops. So, yeah, I think it'd be good. You know, something our coaches can use and just something people can go in and have a, a mess around in and... And chip away that progression. Yeah. You know, if they're kind of like at blue level now, they can play around and get up to red. So you've got your work cut out. That list of <laughs> things that you've just told us. There's a some... lot to do. <laughs> yeah. But we've got, like, i got to say, like, our team is amazing. You know, and these things take time. And we've, we started with two people in the trail team and, like, 17 people in the whole company. Yeah. And now we're up to, like, well, it's probably around mid 80s in the whole company and, and 11 or 12 it'll be 12 when we start in the trail team and that and they they're solid you know the the guys like my role is just to convey the idea like do all the planning yeah i've planned out how all the routes sit on the trail what we're going to do in what order and then it's over to them to bring their like creativity into it okay. and they've all developed like over the years so we've got a team of really, really good trail builders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm excited about. That's it's so like, sick. I'll get enjoyment from it because that, that's the bit I'm really passionate about and love. Yeah. But I like, that's a bit, obviously, everyone wants to build a new trail. So it's really cool to see the guys getting that yeah, yeah, like, yeah. payback. Oh, yeah. That's cool, man. So bring it on. Bring it on. What Red. a great way to wrap up. Uh, all good? Cool. Mate, great guest. Awesome. Fantastic big thanks. conversation. Yeah, Thank you for thanks. coming over. I really appreciate it. You're the real it. deal. It's been great having you on. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. Cheers, guys. Nice one. Pleasure. Right. It's a wrap. <laughs> um, go on. Peace and love. Like and subscribe. Mate, what an episode. Brilliant. I thought you were really great, Davey. Mate, and I thought you were even better. Thanks, dude. Better thanks, than dude. normal. Oh, cheers. Hey, how about we tell our lovely podcast community to hit subscribe here. Yeah. Click on the video on Ollie's face. That's right. Click on the video on my face. Yeah. And follow us at the Ride Companion on Instagram. They can like and comment as well. Please I'm gonna, do. I'm going to try and get this energy and I'm going to bring it into next week. Let's fast forward to next week's episode. Done.